Hey guys, so we are on Own Your Happy this week and I'm so excited to have Courtney. Courtney Willick, we have known each other probably like four or five years in there around and we've just, we haven't seen each other for years. We were just discussing it's been at least, I would say three years. Yeah, because I've been in Alberta three Christmases this year and so we saw each other in Saskatchewan. So it's been- Yeah, it would be three, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And we have just stayed in contact through social media. There is a good part to social media. There really is <laughs> because I feel like I'm kind of on track with what's going on in your life somewhat on the outside and probably vice versa for you. But we have been talking about recording this episode for like, I don't know, six or nine months, 20 yeah. in a year. So I feel like it was even before March. March is like a... I feel like we were talking about recording it and then all the shit happened. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And so then we got set to a back burner. And then last week I was listening to the radio and something came on that triggered the F out of me. And I immediately pulled over and messaged Courtney and I was like, we need to record this. People need to hear this. Right. And so what we're going to talk about is Courtney went booze free, sober. What what term do you use that you're sober? I I say sober now, yeah. At the beginning I didn't. Yeah. Love that word. It's a process. It's like a full journey. Yeah. Um when I when I stopped drinking, I used the term that I was free of alcohol or like had freed myself because that felt right in the moment awesome and um yeah and I say sober alcohol free yeah. whatever yeah and I just want to preface this with I you were not an alcoholic would you say that I, I get asked this a lot for it actually I, you weren't an alcoholic in what I would have called an alcoholic and so let's even right. dig into that because yeah let's dig into that because around that for sure yeah I get asked that a lot actually and um people mostly people will say something like um yeah but you didn't have like a problem yes. right to which I usually respond well define problem exactly right so the way the media feeds us addiction and alcoholism is so wildly different than what it actually looks like in real life, right? Like you watch your favorite show, like let's call it Grey's Anatomy because they deal with this a little bit on Grey's Anatomy, but you have someone who's been like sober for like 25 years and then they have a drink and then they're off the rails and they're drinking at work and doing surgeries and it's just a big dramatic mess right or or someone is um you you just hear all these things right like you're um you know you're an alcoholic if you drink by yourself or if you wake up in the morning and that's the first thing you think about or whatever we're given kind of all of these benchmarks that's one that I always have defined as a true alcoholic is that they cannot not think about it first thing in the morning mm-hmm. so to me right. I'm like I don't feel like Courtney wakes up and is like that at all <laughs> <laughs> well and I think and I think to a certain extent we all do that yeah right like if it's a holiday or if you're going on a trip or if it's um let's say May long weekend Right. And you wake up and you're like, oh, I can't wait to get to the lake so I can, you know, day drink. Right. I think we all kind of do that, but it's so socially accepted. So no one would ever be like, oh, she's drinking at 11 a.m. on May long weekend. Like maybe she should reevaluate her priorities. People are like, good for you. Yeah, that would never be. You you do you. You like kick back you earned it you know or like having mimosas at brunch right like so I think to a certain extent society has really normalized there's a way that you can socially acceptably drink at any time of day Mm -hmm. I could have a mimosa with my breakfast I could have Baileys in my coffee I could you know if I was waking up and but if I woke up 
and had a shot of gin, people would be like, oh, <laughs> that, that's a bit much. <laughs> but what's the difference right? than having a mimosa? Is right? it a Champagne hits you like crazy hard, fast, right? Like, but. But it's um, fascinating that we look at that in a different way that I totally, you know, if we were together and we were on a girl's trip and you were like mimosas, I would be like, mm, yeah. But mm -hmm. if you were like, let's do a shot. I was like that. That's a little hardcore, but it is right? the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. And, and so that's why I always say kind of define, define a problem because, yeah. um, to me, a problem is anything that's holding me back from um, staying connected to my intuition, um, you know, accomplishing the things that I need to accomplish, um, focusing on my personal relationships, being a good parent, um, all of that stuff. And I think that's when we can really dig into it. And you can really, um, for me, I really just looked at it and was like, oh, any amount of alcohol is inhibiting me from mm -hmm. all of these things, right? I was not as good of a mom. I was not as, and even when towards the end, because I actually had a period of about probably a year to a year and a half where I was really just re-examining my relationship with alcohol and not actually mm -hmm. quitting. Yeah. And I would say that's and, where I'm at right now. Yeah. Which is awesome because it really, I, what I started to do was every time I wanted to have a glass of wine, which was my thing, I loved wine. Yeah. Um, I would stop myself and think, okay, why? Yeah. Why do I want a glass of wine? And it started out that the reason was, well, I just want one. I just like the taste. I just like it. It's mm -hmm. fun. But then I made, I forced myself to dig a little bit deeper and say, okay, but, but why? Well, while it was a long day, the kids were loud and you know, got out of control. I'm tired. I'm stressed. Uh -huh. Really what it came down to always was that I liked the way that it felt and I liked the way that it numbed me. I was going to say it's numbing. That's why totally. we all go to it. Is it's that warm numbing feeling. And, and it just became to the point where I couldn't convince myself anymore that it was just harmless yeah. right and and so then I stopped drinking when my kids were awake right I would wait till they would go to bed but then I found myself rushing them to bed right I'm like <laughs> I need you guys to get to bed now because I need a glass of wine right like and then you're like okay <laughs> maybe, maybe. <that's> <laughs> <laughs> right and and nobody in my life I don't think would have said that I had a problem no right it was socially acceptable on every level. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really where we have a cultural problem where- Let's dive into that because uh, we went booze free four years ago, I believe. My husband was really, really sick and we went without booze and it was over about nine months. And we had a little bit of vodka here and there. Uh, that was the one thing he was allowed, which seemed like, how are we going to get through the summer <laughs> without beer? Like looking back on that, it's like, that's so ridiculous. But we learned so much through that time because we went through a Christmas season. We went through camping season. Mm -hmm. We went through, I think it is such a go-to for celebration of like, how do you celebrate? Well, you have a glass of wine or you go out for a drink or you even like date nights were really hard and it like made me start to think about what are my beliefs around this because everything we he couldn't eat a lot of the things out outside restaurants were making as well so it was like seeing all of the booze and the food and the socializing and how all of that is tied and how you really feel like an outsider in the beginning it feels uncomfortable of being like no I'm good oh I'm gonna go to the campfire nope, I just brought my tea and my go mug. And people will be like, why? Why, why aren't you drinking? Why, why, why? Are you why? pregnant? Yes, I wasn't <laughs> at all at that point. Right? <laughs> but there is, like, it's such a, it's an uncomfortable thing. And so I want people to understand that everybody feels uncomfortable, I think, in the beginning of that. 
Totally. And my issue is always like, and the more that I learned, the more that I read and I followed some really amazing women on Instagram, that's kind of how this all started, yeah. who were moms or business women or just especially women, I just gravitated to this because it's so encouraged. It's not even just accept it, it's encouraged. Mm -hmm. Like you can't go to home sense without seeing a glass of wine that's like, you know, mommy juice yeah. on it, like a, a wine glass, right? Yep. Um, and what really got me mad is just that number one, it's a drug. Okay, let's call it what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a mind altering chemical. It's a drug, right? Mm -hmm. It's the only drug that you have to explain not using, right? Yeah. If I was like, I actually don't do heroin. And then <laughs> someone was like, you would never hear someone be like, oh, Courtney, like, yeah. she can't do heroin anymore because she has a problem, <laughs> right? Like no one would ever say that. That's ridiculous. Oh, exactly. Right? Or like, yeah. why, why can't you, yeah. why aren't you doing heroin today, Courtney? Yeah. Like it's, so when we think about it like that, but really there's no difference. There is no, difference. no difference. However, I want to point out that that is people mirroring and projecting because they think they know there is something a little bit wrong with that. They think that is the way to go is that to question somebody why they aren't drinking because they're looking at themselves as like, exactly. Right. It's and easier so to focus on the other. Right. Okay. So it's, it's easier, like it's, and we can even bring it to a societal level with the focus on the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's this huge, and the opioid crisis is real and it's devastating. Right. Do you just explain it a little bit for anybody that doesn't know what you're Well, talking. opioids are just have been over prescribed for so long and people are becoming dependent and it's contributing to so not just death, but homelessness and all kinds of societal problems. Right. And just recently, a pharmaceutical company, I believe in the States was held um, responsible in court and having to pay damages. Um, I don't know the exact company. I don't know that all the details, but they were held criminally responsible for, for wow. opioid use. Right. So it's a big win. What most people don't know is that alcohol actually kills more people every year than all other drugs combined. So, right. but as a society, because alcohol is legal yep. and because everyone drinks. So when you think about it from, a uh, from a legalizing perspective, you have this substance that is killing people at astronomical rates. It's the leading cause of preventable death mm -hmm. by a lot. And then, and then it, we're not able to step back and take a look at that because the people who are making the laws also drink. So in order to actually make a change, you have to be willing to look at yourself, right? So if I'm any kind of a lawmaker and I see that alcohol is killing people and I want to make it and I want to change that, well, I'm not, I have to first be like, okay, well, is there something wrong with my drinking? Yeah. Is there like I drink and it's I don't think we're able to do that. Extreme ownership. <laughs> and I just don't think we're able to do that as a society, right? And yeah. it's such, and it's such a oh my my computer behind went dark that's why my face is even dark but um that's why it's just it's a cash 22 and it's such a generator of tax money and all of this stuff right so so it's it, it makes me so mad because then it's like so tied in with the patriarchy and all and how we're fed the sickness to make money and to numb us and to stop us from really truly living our potential and that's what got me just so fired up in the beginning yeah and then and still I wasn't able to completely quit for so long even knowing all oh, of this stuff it. right yes I think it's a right like for everybody it's just still you still have to do the work on yourself right and then one day um we just uh I was had, I had, it wasn't, it's not even like a big story. 
nothing crazy happened. I had a glass of wine and some shit went down <laughs> that I still have not fully made public, which is fine. Yeah. But I wasn't wasted. I wasn't like nothing dangerous happened. And in the morning I just woke up and I was like, no, I can't, I can't be a part of, um, making things more dramatic for myself anymore. And yeah. then, then I was done. And that was just like, it just clicked. Right. It's such a form of self-sabotage that we think is just the way that we need to live. Like I even look back at Christmas with my family, God love them, like amazing people, but it was just a drunk fest for all of them. I was really reflecting on that this year of what I want Christmas to look like. Hopefully, you know, there's many <laughs> extenuating circumstances there this mm -hmm. year, but also reflecting back on my memories as a kid and they weren't like unhappy memories by any means but I remember it being loud and it was massive parties and there was always some sort of drama involved right because of the use of alcohol and so it's like why is that why why do we crave that like why? It's why? A of passage. It's just so ingrained in society, right? Mm. And people will always bring up like the fact that it's been around for thousands of years. Jesus drank, you know, like all of this stuff. Well, yeah, but they also used to like <laughs> do a lot of things that we don't do anymore, right? But um, yeah, it's a rite of passage. Yeah. Right? In Alberta, it's 18. I grew up in Saskatchewan. I don't know if you grew up in Saskatchewan. It was 19 in Saskatchewan. 18 in Alberta. Right. So there you go. So I was in 18 year old school. kids are in high school. That's right. I because I'm done. So yes, I was in high school. Uh -huh. And the weekends we went to the bar. And I would usually go with older kids because nobody in my grade yet was able to go. But like right. how weird. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's a rite of passage, right? Like I used to be a waitress forever and I served in pubs mm -hmm. and people take their kids out on their 19th birthday. Yep. You know, you go out with your parents and it's not, and these parents don't, aren't trying to sabotage their children. And, you know, like it's just the way that our society works. So that's really where I started to question like and that's why I started to talk about it so much because I'm not the first person to talk about this and there are women who have gone before me who have done amazing work and I'll send you a list of resources too but but I knew that no one in my circles was talking about this and mm -hmm. and I was like super pro mommy juice wine all the time I used to have a blog called whiny mama did you? It's not up anymore, yeah. <laughs> but I posted like six times. It wasn't, I wasn't super dedicated to it, but, no. but I was, and there was this fear for me that like, I was giving up part of my identity, mm -hmm. you know, like, what are people going to think of me? Like, are they going to think I'm a hypocrite? Are they going to think, but, but I think that's where honesty is so freeing because I can say, okay, this is how I used to be. And then I learned more and I changed my mind. Mm-hmm. And there's freedom in just being able to change your mind, right? I think we just get caught up in this, you know, I'm a performer, I'm a singer, and I was a waitress. And both of those industries are heavy partying, heavy alcohol, heavy, yep. you know, that's how I, and I didn't drink in high school. Like I was never a big partier, but I grew into this, these social circles as a young adult where it was just like, let's see how fast we can get drunk. And then that slowed down when I became a parent, but maybe just manifested in a different way. In a different, right? yeah, I think for me too, that, and then I felt like I lost such a social aspect because I felt, uh, I had children before my group of friends by yeah, year. I did too. Most yeah. of them. And so then I felt like I didn't belong in some ways with them because mm -hmm. it wasn't, the main part of my life anymore and it was like early 20s I also drank very little in high school um I remember I had a friend when I was like 14 and his parents owned a liquor store and so he mm -hmm. would borrow booze and 
we would go out at the in night and that was just like that was the cool thing to do and I just remember being like I don't even like the taste of it like why like why are we doing this but I would still go and I would have one maybe two like nothing compared to like I had friends that were like puking drunk all of the time and that was like oh did you see how wasted so and so was oh like all this social side. And so then when I was like mid twenties and had my first son, I did feel very like, well, I can't plan Friday nights and Saturday nights like that anymore. I got to get mm-hmm. up in the morning. I can't do these yeah. things the same way. And so things started to shift maybe even a little bit for me there, but I still drank on and off for sure throughout that. And like full disclosure to everybody, I think I said it already, but I still do have the occasional drink, but I'm at the spot now where I am like, why why are you having this like last night we yeah. were celebrating and so we got different kombucha to celebrate instead so we had yeah. a drink and kombucha actually helped us huge <laughs> because it felt like it was like something that was like celebratory like yay yeah. okay we cheers. do um there is a sparkling fake white wine from the grocery store that we will use for celebrations once in a while and it actually because I don't like sweet drinks I was never like I loved red wine red wine was if there wasn't red wine usually I wouldn't even drink yeah and so that's another part place where you can be like well I don't really have a problem I just like wine right (laughs) because if someone's doing vodka I'm not gonna drink at all I'll just stay sober but that's another thing completely but this um stuff that we found from the grocery store it's called Loxton and it's not sweet and it doesn't taste like grape juice but nice good yeah yeah and then I get to be honest I get a little bit annoyed frustrated that it's like why does that even have to be a thing like Mm -hmm. what why is that even a thought (laughs) and that's the thing you have to sort of meet yourself where you're at Mm -hmm. because you can't do it all at once and when I first stopped it was April of last year so 2019 and I drank non-alcoholic like beer and Radler all summer yeah and it was okay it was not there was no booze right I was like this is not altering my mind at all and then you can start to sort of unpack that like okay well what's the dependency on this part of it right and you can unpack that but for me the first thing was just take out the alcohol and don't be altering your mind get through that part and then you can deal with the rest right I know a lot of sober people who have quit drinking first and then they quit marijuana after right like one thing at a time and be gentle with yourself and also realize that The other thing is realizing that everyone is on a, is at a different place in their journey than you. Right. So Mm -hmm. when you do start to learn and you do start to question your own relationship and you question the systems that are in place that have us medicating without knowing why, then to realize, okay, well, this is my place on my journey and I'm not going to judge someone else. Who isn't there yet because there are people who went before me who didn't judge me for Was being that hard totally yes, yes totally I mean, imagine that would be like there were times where I was like a little bit frustrated with some situations that it was just so all I can do is just talk about it mm-hmm. as loud as I can <laughs> and and you have to let people decide for themselves right like I had people who I was really close to who didn't slow down right and and I had to be like okay well I was still a worthy person Mm -hmm. and worthy of love when I was drinking yes and now I'm not suddenly better than everyone because I've made this change it's for me and it's not for anyone else and that is hard I don't know anyone who's become sober who hasn't gone through a period of like really judging other people (laughs) right but it's just being aware of okay well I'm judging them because I'm actually judging myself because I know I used to be like that right so now I need to just look in where deal with that and then then it's kind of like you do you yeah and I want to give you massive kudos for that because that's not easy work to do it's all so hard yes it's 
the hardest, it's the hardest work that I've ever done. It takes like daily and like almost like hourly minute by minute self-reflection of, okay, why am I feeling this way? This is a negative. I'm judging this person. Why? You almost have to be like your own therapist in your ear being like, okay, stop. Rewind. Yeah. What are you judging about yourself right now? Deal with it, write it down, whatever, move on to the next. It is, and it's ongoing, right? Like a lot of it gets easier, but. I think in many ways, like I've gone through similar situations just with belief systems in my own mind and trying to overcome some of the thought patterns and rewiring Mm -hmm. and all of that. And I think it is the same in that it gets easier because you notice the judgment of yourself right away. Like you can kind of get to, okay, why is this actually a thought? What is actually going on? And I think some people in the beginning, that's where they give up because it's hard to, it feels like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this to myself? It's just easier to grab a glass of wine. I also, I read last year sometime and I was like, this is stuck with me a lot of when you have a certain buzz, let's say from liquor, you are fully present in the moment. Yeah. And so you're not thinking like lots of people take it too far and then that becomes a whole nother story. But there is a part of you that craves to be present in the moment and be okay and happy. And I was like, yeah, that really is what happens for a lot of us is that we're craving that mindfulness practice of like, I'm just living here in this moment where my two Mm -hmm. feet are right now. And I was able to find that through meditation, but I wouldn't have associated those two things to be a similar Mm -hmm. feeling at all. Well, I think we need to consider the idea as well that alcoholism or addiction, um, and I use the term alcoholic very, I don't really use it anymore actually, because I don't feel like it's taking a person and reducing them to one thing, right? Whereas it's someone who struggles with addiction or someone who um, overuses alcohol or overuses a substance, right? There's still a whole person Mm -hmm. outside of that. that, but alcoholism or addiction, it's not, it, it is a disease and you'll hear that a lot, yeah. but it's really a symptom of, it's a symptom of something that has become its own thing. It's worthy. So yeah. And it's a symptom of some kind of trauma always. Yeah. Right. And I was just talking to someone about this the other day and they were like, yeah, but like, I don't have any trauma. Like I was not, I had a great childhood. I like whatever, all this stuff. And I'm like, we trauma. have <laughs> right trauma is something just as simple as I didn't feel like there was a place for me where I could be myself yes. or I felt like I was more fun when I was drinking There's I actually- felt like I was more attractive when I was drinking exactly I felt like I was more interesting right so you're 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 allowing society to shape you into this thing and then you're keeping yourself numbed Mm-hmm. And I think as adults, we like, I look at my kids and they are just fully who they are. Yep. They're just fully who they are every day, every minute. And then along the way, you're just being constantly told that there's stuff that's wrong with you. Everything yeah. starts to pile. Just on. make it smaller, make it smaller. Yes. For me, that was it anyway. <laughs> I did a video. Shh, quiet. <laughs> Emotional trauma was really fascinating to me when I started to learn about it because I was similar. I would have been that girl that was like, I had a great childhood. Like everything was yeah, yeah was nothing to complain about. And it's fascinating to me how society makes trauma into such a like dramatic word. We all have emotional trauma and there is a video on my YouTube. I'll link it below here, but it's anything that we've had emotional attachment to. So trauma can actually be something that was a really good feeling, which Mm. again you would associate to being like I feel really pretty I feel really fancy or Mm -hmm. I feel like I can dance when I drink I'm more fun people laugh at me people like to hang out with me right um and and I think there's just beauty and I really feel like over the last you know it's been a, a little bit over a year and a half but I feel like I've really had a returning yeah to my true 
itself, which is like, I can't even describe. People will always say like, oh, sobriety, it's worth it. It's so much better. It's so freeing. It's whatever. And it's hard and it can feel really isolating. And, but if you can find those supports in place, whatever they are for you, you don't have to go to AA to get, to get sober. You can figure out what's right for you. And then once you can kind of get through it, little by little, and all of a sudden I've looked back and been like, wow, I have like, everything's different. Yeah. I'm, I'm not even a different person. I'm more me I'm than I ever me. have been. Yes. Than I ever have been since I was young. Right. Mm -hmm. And the people who have stuck around or who have, you know, gravitated towards me now are people who actually accept me, like me, me. Yeah. So, and some of those relationships that I had, you know, where we drank a lot together, whatever, they fell away mm -hmm. and it's okay because the people that I have in my life now are like, they're my people yes. and they love me just the way that I am, which is, there's so much beauty and freedom in that. It's like, I can't even describe it. It's like worth every ounce of hardness. Yes. <laughs> you know? Okay. So I actually want to touch on that even deeper because I think, I think when we go through something traumatic and I'm going to, going to call becoming sober a little bit traumatic because it was a lot for your system to handle mm -hmm. feeling like an outsider, all the inner work, all of those things. It's not necessarily going to be the people that you think are going to support you that fully support you. Right. Yeah. They're not going to be like, I know I went through this when my son's dad passed away that the people that I would have thought were like my people, the closest people, those weren't necessarily the people, some of them, but not all of them were able to handle that. And mm -hmm. again, that's their journey. But at the time it felt like I had effed up, I had done something wrong. And so I think it's similar in this, that it's like, has nothing to do with the other people in your life. This is just your journey. This is your thing. That's okay. Fine. Well, it has nothing to do with, and it has nothing to do with you, whether no. they stick around or not. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's their thing. Right. And there are relationships that I couldn't, you know, there was a time when I would have been super uncomfortable around someone who like constantly talked about being sober. Yeah. You know, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay because I had my journey and I'm really happy with where I am at that. And I am so happy with anyone. The only thing that I really, really, really want people to do is just understand why they're drinking. I don't believe that everyone necessarily has to be sober, yeah. but I think that we drink without, without knowing why we just do it because totally we just do, do it. Just a habit. It's just something that. Because I can't drive. I mean, you live in Alberta. You, it's a yeah. different, it's like, it's bad in Saskatchewan, but it's a different world here. You yeah. cannot go anywhere without seeing a liquor store or an advertisement for alcohol. When we moved to Oak Tokes, I just driving like the main street, I was like, I swear we just passed 16 liquor stores. I've never actually counted them, but it is the most readily available item. It's there are everywhere. Oh, it's. Yeah, it's and when you think about what that kind of messaging does to you subconsciously, mm -hmm. it's like it just makes you constantly be craving that thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I and so, but why? So why? Why are you reaching for the glass of wine? Why? Just know why. And then I truly believe that if we really sit and sit with the heart of thinking about okay, why, and also then is there something that I could replace this with that would make me feel sort of the same way, right? Mm -hmm. For me, it was tea in the evenings instead of a glass of wine because it felt warm and it was comforting and, you yeah. know, all those things. Too. And then I also didn't stay up way too late watching Grey's Anatomy and then have to get up the next day, hungover, parent my kids, right? Like it's a snowball, it. right? It's just about making one healthy choice at a time yes. for not only healthy for your body, but healthy for your mind, mm -hmm. right? Healthy for your soul. So, yeah. What would yeah. be your words of wisdom on the trickiest part? Like, yes, find out your why. I totally agree with that. I really encourage everybody. I also really encourage everybody to just like Courtney brought this to my attention. It was not in my, like, I just didn't notice my perception wasn't there of it, 
but now I'm so aware of how often it is a positive media post or in the news or I don't watch the news I don't know why I said that but like where it's everywhere and that it's just Mm -hmm. like this is what you do like there's so many songs that will be like like even watching my 13 year olds listen to different music now in the last couple of years I'm like Mm, is that really what I want him to be putting into his subconscious constantly yeah. like fine let's get drunk pop the champagne da, 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 all of these pieces mm-hmm. but back to it what are your words of wisdom to people that are like just kind of breaking into this in that they're like okay I want to do more social events sober or what like what was the toughest I think the hardest thing for me was actually admitting to myself that it was something that I wanted to release from my life. Mm -hmm. I think that there's this um, idea in our society that you have to have a problem Mm -hmm. before you can quit. And so you feel like if you're quitting, you're admitting to yourself in the world that you have a problem. Yeah. And I would say, don't worry about labeling it at all. Anything that's not serving you, you can release anything that's not serving you mm-hmm. at all, like anything. So just start there. Yeah. Just start by just admitting to yourself that this is something that you don't want to take part in anymore. And don't worry about other people's judgment because first of all, people are not thinking about you nearly as much as you think they are. Right. <laughs> Second of all, they're worried about their own stuff. Right. And when someone judges you for not drinking, like you said, Jen, they're really just judging themselves. Mm -hmm. They really just don't want to do that work and admit to themselves. Well, if she quit, then does that mean I should, right? People aren't ready. So that's okay. Yeah. Do you, and like read books, find people who have gone before you because it makes you feel so much less alone. Follow Courtney. She's amazing. <laughs> you are, because you don't like, there's no shaming in anything you post. You're just very open. You're very honest about things that you've gone through or thoughts you've had or a switch of beliefs over the last few years or all of those things. I find it extremely refreshing the way you share. And it makes, it just makes me so much more aware of all of it in general. So yeah, I would definitely yeah. recommend following Courtney's journey on it because you just integrate it so nicely through there I think there's just power in admitting that we're we're constantly evolving we are Mm -hmm. we are evolutionary beings right I don't feel the same way about music that I did when I was a teenager Mm -hmm. so you know there's there's power in just admitting that I'm a human, I'm growing, I'm older than I was yesterday. I have different opinions about things and I'm, and it's okay. Yes. Right. I don't have to drink. I don't have to, I would, I was the mom who would be like, Oh, come on. Like one glass of wine won't hurt. Right. Like that's, and that's hard. That's hard to look at yourself and be like, I like shamed people for not drinking. Like that's, <laughs> I've totally done that too. I have right? I have right, and and yeah. you can just say, okay, that was maybe not my best moment, mm-hmm. and now I can leave that and move forward with whatever else, and just do better. Like know better, do better, right? Like Maya Angelou, yeah, always, always. When you know better, do better. Yeah, and one choice at a time. Don't look at it as, I think, with anything. We look at it as like, well, for the rest of my life now. Oh God. That's oh my God. That's just the hardest thing. thing. I remember being like, well, I'm not gonna ever like not drink again. Like, what about like last wet last summer I got married? Yes. And it's like, (laughs) what, like not even at your wedding? Yeah. And I just started to be like, I don't know. I'm done for now. Yeah. And then it just I knew like when I actually quit, quit, I knew. I knew that I wouldn't be drinking again, but, but I think before that, before that day, when I woke up and I was like, no, I'm done. Yeah. Even like the day before I wouldn't have been ready to be like, I'm done forever. Yes. Like you just meet yourself where you're at. It's okay. Does your partner drink? No. Or did he do that at the same time or was that separate? He actually started on his journey before me and yeah. you know, yeah, we kind of have 
you know, we just, we don't have alcohol in our house because we just feel like, well, I wouldn't anyway, because I'm just so against the whole like system of it. It's not. And I think it's different for everyone where some people feel like, you know, it's just a them problem and like everyone else can, but I won't, you know, and I will be very, very open with the boys about the dangers of just substances. Yeah. Right. But we don't want it in our house. We don't want our kids to see us yeah. drinking. So if you and... were seeing a get together, would you allow it to come into your house? I had never thought about this. No. Story. Sorry to put you completely off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't. But I like, and hmm. I've thought about too. Oh, I've thought about that too lots. And um, for me, it just goes against everything now that I you know, believe in. And I just kind of feel like, like at our wedding, we didn't have any alcohol. So perfect example. Our families are not sober. Like I am, you know, my husband doesn't drink and, and most of our families do. And we just, you know, we bought like five cases of bubbly at Costco (laughs) and and that's what we had. And, and nobody really cared. It wasn't you know, a big deal. I think some people, people left our wedding afterwards and went and went and had a glass of wine or whatever, and that's fine. But I just didn't want it. I didn't want it around. And love it. I feel like people can go one night, one event, yeah. without it. And this is bringing up like a childhood memory for me of always having my grandpa's drink when he would come, and my nana's actually, and mm-hmm. making sure that we had the proper mix and the proper supplies. Um, and the booze that went along with it so that when they got there because they would travel we were in Alberta and they were in Saskatchewan at the time they could get there and they could have their drink and that was you know like the biggest honor we could the least we could do for them traveling all that way is that we could have this and so I went through a similar uh, with my mom yeah it's it's a really ingrained family belief that that is Mm -hmm. how to show appreciation or love is to have those things. I think, yeah. And I think there's so many other ways too that we can show people that we're thinking of them, right? And I mean, our families know that we don't drink, right? It's not like, it's just like, I'm pretty vocal about it with everybody. That's another question I have. Did you like make an announcement or did you like, did your mom or how did that look for you? Um, I actually didn't tell anyone not even my husband (laughs) I just it was just for me at the beginning I think I was I think I was 50 days before I put anything on social media Mm -hmm. but and I think it was like a couple weeks before I told my husband even I just didn't want to like in my mind I was like oh if I say it then it's real right and then as it came up I would just practice saying I remember the first vividly the first time that someone offered to buy me a bottle of wine for something that I did and I was like maybe like three days sober yeah yeah and I was like (sighs) I remember sending the text and just my heart was racing and just being like actually I don't drink anymore and and just being like, oh my God, what is she going to think? What is, yeah. and yeah, it was new. It was scary. It's scary at the beginning. And then I just started to talk about it and it just. Now it's know? accepted, but I, I did want to ask that for people mm-hmm. that are thinking of, because I feel like it is, that's one place where I have been uncomfortable for sure of going to other people's houses or get togethers and yeah no we don't and like look at how I even do that just to say you that I shrink I couldn't even say the word sober for a while like I couldn't it's just you'll get there if you are going to be at social gatherings bring something for yourself just be like oh no I just brought my own yeah and you don't even have to say I don't drink yeah but you don't have to you don't have to to say anything (laughs) you could just be like no thanks I'm good whatever right it's it's so different for everybody and I think that's what like you don't have to you don't have to ever tell anybody if you don't want to but I feel 
like yeah. you probably will want to, like you get to a place where you're like really proud and you just want everyone to know how good it is. And the most, every time I post anything about sobriety, I always get at least a few messages from people being like, I thought I was the only one or thank you for talking about this because, and I think that there's power. This is your like Dharma. This is your purpose. Yeah. Like, this is not what you <laughs> there, do. Yeah. There's power in sharing your story because right. if I've learned anything, it's that there is nothing that you are going through that is unique to you. Everybody, yes. there's, there's always someone who is sharing the same experience as you. And when we share our stories, then number one, I don't feel as alone. Mm -hmm. And I know that I can help someone else who maybe is, you know, not sure. Yep. Feel That's less alone. I started Own Your Happy for that exact yeah. reason, because I felt so alone in so many different areas of life. Yeah. So many. And I was like, nobody struggles with these things. I am just so messed up. I'm so broken. I'm so effed up. But like, all oh, it's just not true. Work. Not yeah do it all it might no. not be the exact same scenarios but the feelings at the core are there mm -hmm. for others too okay when let's talk about what you're doing now because you're going to school for something very exciting yes I have a very full plate these days so I still have my Arbonne business yep. and I am going to school to become a birth doula yes. which is something that I've been so passionate about for so long um, since I had my first son who is now turning eight, yep. I've always in the back of my mind been like, Oh, maybe one day it would be a doula. And then this summer I was just like, now it's time. And I'm, so I found a really amazing course and I'm doing that. And I'm also, um, quilting. I have like a little side quilting business, which is really more of like a passion project. It's not really a moneymaker. But <laughs> <laughs> you just enjoy making it but it feels good. And so, yeah, that's what I'm up to. So I love my it. life is very full of like sobriety, birthy things and skincare and boys. all the stuff and boys. boys. So many boys. Yeah. <laughs> so many boys. When will you be complete in your doula or is there an end? Um, yeah, my class will be done in January and then I have to, and then I just have some um, stuff to finish up to certify but yeah yeah and so then you'll be helping people and will you help people I guess you don't fully know this but will you do it in an online capacity it kind of depends what the restrictions are right now in Alberta doulas are allowed in yeah. the hospitals um and so it just it just depends we don't know what's going to happen but yeah online is an option in person is an option there's a lot more flexibility with home births yeah. because how many more people are uh, doing home births right now side note do you know is I don't know I think it's about that? the same oh is it the, I guess it's just the people in my maybe world. more maybe more because of COVID but yeah I have a few people in my world that have done home births or planned home birth and I'm just like oh this is so cool like that was never mm -hmm. my youngest is six and we lived rural and I had complications with the first, so he went to NICU. And um, you were in Saskatchewan where there's hardly any midwives and you can't do a home birth without a midwife. It wasn't so. a thing. And I'm just like, no. this is the most, like I have a good friend that I do the podcast with that did a home birth in the spring. And I'm like, that is the yeah. most beautiful experience you just had. Like just such a different, like my births were beautiful yeah. too in their own right. It was totally just such a different story. And I'm like, I'm not having any more babies, but if I was, there's it would be a very different plan going in that's for sure yeah for sure yeah well thank you so much for sharing all of your tidbits thank you, you for having me amazing at socials <laughs> and so I feel it's okay and again I'm putting you right on the spot I could cut this if it's really not your thing <laughs> that people can message you and ask you questions for sure yes right. please do yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert at all but I have got lots of resources and lots of Experience. lots of stuff so yeah yeah tons of experience yeah. okay well thank you thank you